Okay, so I'm Brian Harfey, so I designed uh, Zoo 3603C. Uh, so this is a lab course uh, for upper division biology majors, so it's a science course. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of this course to show you some of the innovative things uh, that we were able to do with this course. So the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, some stuff about the lectures. And I'm going to give you an example of how we incorporated uh, novel features into the lectures of this course. Innovative aspects of this course that we were able to do in the recording studio with the green screen is, as you can see in this example in a few seconds here, is we were able to re kind of be inside the video. So you'll see me lecturing about this is in zebrafish, which is a zebrafish is actually you can buy these things in the pet store, uh, your local pet store. But this is a uh, movie of embryonic development of a zebrafish. So you can see I'm kind of inside the screen at the same time I'm showing the movie. So on the top here is actually hours. So this is about 48 hours. 60 hours into development. You can see all the cells are developing or dividing on the top of the yolk. So up here, whoop, up here is all the cells dividing. This is the other kind of cool thing that you can do is you can, as you can see on the screen, you can have a pointer going at the same time, which is a little red dot uh, to show you the, what I'm talking about, the specific features of the developing embryo. You can also zoom in. So what I just did there on the screen is I zoomed in uh, to show you a close-up of the embryo. So this just shows you a second example of how you can show movies uh, in the lecture. So again, it's the green screen, so it's just a blank screen behind me. I have my finger's actually on a mouse pad, which is why I can move around the little pointer there. And this is a kind of a cool example of this is now frog development. So this is a large number of frog embryos sitting in a petri dish. You'll see in a second here, they're going to start to divide. Um, and it's, this is a really great example of something called synchronous division, where every embryo divides uh, at the same time. One of the really innovative parts of this course were the online labs. So this is an upper division biology course, and it's a C course, so there are labs in this course. So how do we get labs to work in an online environment? So what we decided to do was to collaborate with a company called Labster, which is based in Denmark, I believe. And what they did is they took our ideas and they incorporated them into a virtual environment. So the example you see here is the standard lab. And I should mention there are three labs in this course. This is an example here, what I'm showing you here is a standard lab um, that's in all the different labs. And what you can do is you can move around the lab to various things. So what's blinking here is your lab coat because they want you to put your lab coat on before you start. So let's put our lab coat on. If we click this, now we're wearing a lab coat. Um, so it takes you through all the different things that you need to do in the lab. So this is just an example of the chick and mouse lab. So it's asking me to uh, now find the glove box. So here's the glove box. So let's uh, be safe here and put on our gloves. All right, so now we have blue gloves. So uh, this is just a tutorial. Um, it also takes you through a number of help options in case you get stuck. We'll continue here. Uh, now it's asking us to go to the x-rays because we're going to start off in this uh, looking at limbs uh, that are defective. So each of the labs are built around a case. So we wanted to base the labs in reality. We just didn't want students going into a lab and telling them this is what you have to do without giving them background on why they're actually doing something. So in this lab here, which is about limb development using the mouse and chick model system, we actually start off with a patient that has a genetic defect where their forelimbs, which is their arms, resemble their hind limbs. And this is a real defect found in humans. And the student is taken through a series of experiments in this lab to try to find out what genes are responsible for making humans have their arms resemble their legs. Um, as you can see on the bottom, there's a bunch of text going on to tell a story. And we'll click through this really fast so we can get to the lab. Um, I should also mention on each of the screens, you can do a theory. So if you don't know uh, information about the topic, you can use all clickable. Uh, you can learn more information about this is something that you're interested in. For example, the genetic condition this kid has is actually called Lyberg syndrome. Uh, this is again the arms turning into legs. You can also look at uh, media, which currently there isn't any because we haven't taken any pictures yet. And then your overall goal uh, throughout the lab. So we're going to start off with the introduction and then you can see all these learning objectives here, uh, the things that you should learn by the time you finish the lab. Okay, so here's an example of what the student would see initially. So there's two x-rays on the screen here. So one is a normal arm, and one is the patient's arm. And what the student will realize as we click through this is that the normal arm actually more resembles the knee. So this is a normal knee here, and this is the patient's arm, which actually resembles the knee more than the arm does. So this is done to help the student have sort of a basis 
or a, a foundation of why they're actually doing the experiments. And I'm not going to take you through all the parts of this lab, but at the end of the day, uh, the student realizes that there's a gene that's mutated in this patient that causes their arm to resemble uh, their leg. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do in the labs virtually that no one's allowed to do uh, for legal reasons. Uh, it's also too expensive. Um, so the experiments, uh, some of the experiments, well, I'll show you an example of in a second, some of the experiments in this lab takes a machine that costs a half million dollars, which you're not going to let undergraduates uh, access to a half million dollar machine usually. There's also time issues. So this lab, if you did it in uh, a lab here at the University of Florida, it would take you probably in the order of three to four months, which obviously you can't do in an undergraduate environment. And the third thing is, is that this is dealing with mouse and chick embryos, so you have to do all the uh, courses that would allow you to work with vertebrates. And that's also very time consuming. Uh, to have large numbers of students take these online modules just to get certified to then touch a mouse embryo. So for those three reasons, the virtual labs have huge advantages over what you would do uh, in a regular environment in a residential setting. This is Tony, who has uh, his arm resembling his leg. And this just takes you through a conversation with him uh, where it turns out that it runs in the family. So when you're doing the lab, there'll also be bunches of questions. So the students will have to go through these sort of questions to make it onto the next uh, part of the lab. So this allows us to, first of all, grade the students, so they're graded on these questions. And secondly, it gives us uh, an idea of how the student is learning. So if they get these questions wrong, uh, it will go uh, back to the theory, so the student can look up the theory to try to learn why they got the question wrong. All right, so then it says, let's go to the lab and do the experiment. So this, this uh, Tony, I think, has a genetic defect, or potentially has a genetic defect. Uh, so what we do here is kind of cool. So now we ask the students to make a hypothesis. So we've given them the background on the patient, which is exactly what you do in the, in the clinic. Um, and then you don't know what's wrong. So any of these options could be right. Uh, so you can pick, or the student can pick one of these three choices. doesn't matter which one they pick, because at this point we don't know which is right and which is wrong. And then we go to the lab. But what happens is at the end of the lab, uh, they come up with a conclusion, and then they see if their hypothesis at the beginning matches the conclusion at the end. And if it doesn't, that's fine. They don't get any points off. Um, it just shows that sometimes when you make a hypothesis, it's not always correct at the end when you actually do the experiments. So this is the first experiment that the student does. Uh, so they're going to use chicken eggs. Alright, so the first thing they have to do is they have to look at the embryo. And you can't, these are fertilized eggs, so there's actually embryos in these chicken eggs here. Uh, what you can't do is you can't just take an egg and cut it open. Because what happens is, is the embryo is really close to the top of the egg. So if you just cut the egg open without doing anything else, kill the embryo. We don't want to kill the embryo because what they're going to do is they're going to cut a window, which is a piece of the eggshell off, and they're going to be able to see the embryo developing on top of the egg over various times. Uh, that's what the microscope is here for, where they're actually going to be able to take pictures, and they can go back at later points of the experiments uh, and actually look at their data. So this is, this is a good way of allowing students to keep a lab notebook. Now we have to sterilize that, and we have to make a hole in the egg. Alright, so now we have a hole in the egg, and now we have to take out the album. I'm going to throw that out in the sharp spin. And now we're going to do a piece of tape. Okay, so this is a great example of something that when I was designing these labs that I absolutely wanted to happen, which is to make mistakes. So you don't want a student to go through a virtual lab and never have something wrong happen, because when you're in the residential setting, things always go wrong, and you wanted, I wanted to make that also happen in the virtual lab. So this is an example of something that went wrong. So I did the steps in the wrong order. And what happened is I made a hole in the egg, and the yolk all came out, and the embryo all came out. So the reason this happened is because I didn't lower the embryo enough before I went and took the scissors and cut the embryo out in the top of the egg. So you can see on my lab bench here, there's yolk all over the place. And this is actually a picture we took in my lab just to demonstrate what happens in real life uh, when you do this experiment incorrectly. Okay, so this course also had uh, assignments each week. So students were required to do the assignment. It, uh, it came out to be, I have to look it up, how much percent of their grade at the end. I think it was like about 20% of the final grade. Uh, so the assignments build on what they learned in lecture. So for example, they weren't from the lecture themselves, but you had to understand what was going on in the lecture to be able to do the assignment. And this is one example. So this is an assignment that's about bat development. 
We never went over bat development in the, in the, in the, in the lecture part of the course. What we did go over was mouse chick and a bunch of other model systems like zebrafish and frogs. Okay, so this course won the innovative or imaginative approach, approach to course residentially. It's a much different experience and I don't think as fulfilling for the students as it is for uh, the students that are taking it online. So for example, the labs which you saw, those labs can't be done uh, in a residential course. The discussions where students are discussing back and forth is very difficult to do uh, when you have 50 or so students sitting in front of you in kind of a standard lecture format. Uh, the assignments allow the students to think really deeply about a topic. You can do that residentially, but it's, it's sometimes difficult on a weekly basis to allow students or to be able to have students do that sort of thing. Um, so this course, though it has the same learning objectives as the residential course, is taught very differently. And uh, my opinion and the feedback we've gotten from students is that they, they have a very different experience when they take this course 